flash back to my very first day ever elk hunting. This was 20 years ago, the year was 2012. My dad and I are out, we don't really know what we're doing. We bought a Wayne Carlton DVD um, on elk calling and that's what we learned. And so mid morning, first day, we're sneaking through the woods. My dad's maybe five feet behind me and all of a sudden he whispers, he's like, Steve, stop. And so I stop, I'm just like frozen in time, looking into the, the forest, expecting to see a patch of an elk or something. And then he says in a, norm, in a more normal voice, he's like, no, Steve, look down. And so I look and literally at the base of my feet was this elk shed. One more step, I would have tripped on it, which is one of my lifelong goals is to trip on an elk shed. Again, 20 years ago, I, I, you know, finding this, I was in awe. I was, I was also scared. I was like, oh my gosh, like elk this big live in the woods. And I just like had never really been around that or seen that. Then we fast forward um, to that evening. Dad has got a hoochie mama, a squeeze elk call. Like we didn't know how to use the elk reed. So he's like 20 yards away from me. I'm downwind of him. And like every 15 or 20 minutes, he squeezes on the hoochie mama. Sure enough, we call in this really nice six point bowl and the bowl, he doesn't swing downwind to come to me. He comes right to my dad and he like, keeps from me to you away. He's like, like two yards away and he's sitting there, like the bowl's just sitting there staring at my dad. And I'm like, you know, 20 yards away, just looking at him. Didn't have a shot, but crazy cool experience. Needless to say, I was hooked. That was my first day ever elk hunting. And my only regret is that I did not take a picture. Like no way to really remember that. Fortunately, still have the shed and I will never sell the shed because it just really um, you know, seals this, this crazy memory that I had with my dad. So now we fast forward to the year 2012. Um, this is my very first photo assignment. And I, was, I was fresh out of college and the assignment was to go up to uh, the Yukon, so we'll go up to Whitehorse in the Yukon um, with Arctic Red River Outfitters and we we're going to trail horses in basically 200 miles across the Yukon into the NWT and I was up there to photograph and film it. And so one thing about this is the last time someone tried to trail horses in on this, this route, I think they had 15 horses, every single horse died. So then, and that, so that was 30 years prior. So then we go up there and we're like, all right, we're going to give it a go. And the outfitter really wanted to run horseback hunts in his NWT outfit. And the only way to do it is we have to trail horses in two weeks to, to get the horses there. And once the horses were there, the hunters would fly in. The first day, um, gosh, probably in the first two hours, I got bucked off seven times. Um, I had a camera with a 24 to 70 lens. Uh, one time when I got bucked off, I, I just had my neck strap around me like this. The camera goes flying up in the air. I hit the deck, hit the ground. I watched the camera go like lens smashes right into the, the dirt. Fortunately, it just broke the front um, element of the lens. I didn't break the whole lens. I was able to get it repaired, but it was a spendy $500. Some of those days we would go a mile because we were going through this crazy boggy country and um, horses were like falling in beaver ponds or getting stuck, or we would have big wrecks, like all pack saddles would, would come apart. Just mad chaos and other days we'd go like 30 miles so our, our 13th day on the trail this was july 13th 2012 happened to be a friday the 13th i've never been superstitious in my life until this day so it's our 13th day we've got basically one more day to get to the nwt border which is like our final destination so we're all kind of like we're stoked we're we're on high like pretty stoked we're almost there so we're following this river drainage um up and we're just like along this, this small creek maybe like quarter of the size of the Gallatin and we got to follow it up until we get up to this mountain pass and once we're at the mountain pass like then we're into the NWT and then that's when we've made it to our final destination so we're following this creek and then the creek it starts getting steeper and the canyon just starts getting more and more narrow and um, the creek goes right into this box canyon it's really tight like no wider than this table and the water's just pumping through it and we're like well let's try to ride the horses up it let's see if they can do it and because it's it's not a not a super long section and so we start running the horses up and they just can't do it the water's got to be five feet deep and it's just like really pushing on them pretty hard so we're like well we can't go up it so we have to like go up and around this this big big gorge big box canyon and the only way to do that was um there's like this like right before the mouth of the canyon, there's this big willow face. It's, it's gotta be a 45 degree slope, like really, really steep. And so we, we all get off our horse and we're all, we're all leading multiple horses. So we, we um, untied them all so they're not connected to each other. And the lead guide takes his horse and just walks his horse up this slope. 
And like, as he's walking, he's literally having to like hold on to his horse and prevent him from tipping over backwards because his horse is trying to walk straight up. And as he goes, he's just like tipping. So we kind of had to like zig and zag our way up. So we had five wranglers and I think we had like 23 horses. And so, you know, you couldn't have a wrangler like lead each horse individually. So it's like after the first one went, we just like untied one and like, all right, go for it. We just kind of like sent him up and he made it up just fine. A few of them like tumbled before they got about 10 yards up the hill, but they all, they all were making it. And um, eventually it's just me at the bottom and there's two horses left. And uh, the first horse goes, his name's Cookie. He's this big blue roan, big, just big pack horse, real young horse. He's only like three years old. And he goes up and the kind of the, the, the route that you're supposed to, all the previous horses had taken was like, you go up and you kind of angle left a little bit. And if you, if you angle left, it just takes you into like the, the best country of this, you know, 45 degree slope. But you had to go up probably 200 yards to get all the way up there. And so Cookie goes up and he gets up maybe 100 yards. And then all of a sudden he dog legs to the right. He just like on his own, just like, well, everybody went that way. I'm going to go this way. So he cuts this way. Stupid horse. And uh, <laughs> it's a love hate with horses. Anyway, so he, he cuts off to the right. And he goes right into this big dead folly section. And he's trying to like jump over the deadfall. And again, we're on like a 45 degree slope. So every time he jumps up, like he's on his hind legs, he starts to tilt over backwards. And then here comes the horse coming up behind him. And you know, Cookie's not, he's not like fallen yet, but here comes the horse up behind him. And horses are, ha are herd animals. They just follow whoever is in front of them typically, especially if they're you know, on their own. So Cookie jumps to try to get up on, like get up over this deadfall. Horse comes up behind him, literally runs into him, and Cookie ends up like tipping over backwards and basically does a full, like full splay tomahawk down the mountain. Like here comes Cookie. And the problem with him cutting off to the right was that put him above the gorge. So as he's tomahawking down, he ends up shooting off this like 80 foot cliff and lands right in the river from like media away, just dead, just hit and just died. And I was the only one at the bottom. Um, yeah, wild, wild uh, horse experience. And so fortunately the horse that was following Cookie uh, ran up to the left and he made it up just fine. Um, but then the, uh, one of the wranglers who was up top, she had heard just like this loud crash and she had no idea what would happen. So she ran, ran to the edge and she yells down. And she's like, Steve, are you okay? And I'm trying to be calm, cool and collected. I'm like, I'm okay, but Cookie's dead. And so she comes down and um, a couple of other wranglers come down and a few stayed up there and a crazy emotional moment. Like Cookie was all of our favorite horse. He was definitely the most improved. He, I think he was only a three year old horse and just, you know, from the start, he was just this totally green horse that had been packed like once. And then after like 13 days on the trail, like really, like we all kind of became like, kind of like a family, you know, like it was just part of the team. Super emotional moment. People are crying. And when you look upstream, you know, there's Cookie just <laughs> dead in this, in this creek and the water's cascading over him. And behind him is just this massive box canyon. And, and then behind, behind that, I, I call them God rays, but they're like these crazy rays of light coming into the canyon behind him. It was like late afternoon, um, early evening, and just like one of the most beautiful scenes and also gnarly scenes I've ever seen. And in that moment, because it was such an emotional time, I was like, I put my camera down and I was like, I like this, this doesn't feel like my place to be shooting photos of this crazy, sad moment. And to this day, that is my biggest photography regret in my career is not taking a photo of that. Like I got it up here for sure, but eventually I'll probably forget that. And like, just to have a photo, just to remember this crazy, crazy experience, um, would have been, uh, something else. So then we fast forward to 2016. So at this point I'm, this is actually my first year out as a freelance photographer, but I've been doing photography for like professionally for a little while. And I was up in, um, British Columbia and on a moose hunt and it was archery moose hunt but horseback and we were trailing across this big plateau and probably had to go like 20 miles one morning just to just to get into some new moose country and um it's the middle of the rut middle of september and the moose are just rutting super hard 
like if anybody's ever seen a moose rutting, they've got like a, like a white glaze over their eyes. I mean, they'll come into five yards and just sit there and stare at you. It's, they're, it's wild. So anyway, as we're trailing horses across this uh, plateau, here comes a small bull moose to check out our string of horses. And I think we had about a dozen horses. So bull comes in, he actually comes into about 10 yards of us. And at the time, and I, I do this always, but when I'm on photo assignments, I always keep a, a wide angle lens with, with the camera body like, like here. And then on my shoulder strap, I usually keep a, a zoom like this guy, like 70 to 200. So I'm kind of always have both, uh, both perspectives. Um, so this bull is like 10 yards away, just like staring at our string of horses, wondering if it's like, wow, this is my lucky day. I just found a dozen ladies all for me. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, they, they weren't moose, they were horses. But anyway, so this, uh, this moose eventually kind of figures it out and he just starts to walk off. And then we start to continue and along this route and the moose then kind of comes back. And as he's coming back, like, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be a sick shot. This moose is gonna cross right in front or, or like, like basically like the, the hunter and the guide are gonna be like, uh, um, sorry, the moose is gonna be, be between the hunter and the guide. And so this, this scene here, so the moose is coming across. And again, I'm on a horse here and I'm, I'm actually leading three horses. So it's kind of hard to like take photos when you're a, on a horse, and B, also leading three horses. So the only way to do this, I was like, I need to stay back. I need to create some separation here. And I shot this with, with this lens here. But so I'm on, the, I'm on the horse, and the horse, again, they're herd animals. They want to be up next to their buddy. So this horse's buddy was this guy. And I was like, I need to be back like 50 yards from this horse in order to get this shot. So I let go of my lead rope, praying that these three horses I'm leading don't figure out that they're now free. Fortunately, they didn't. And then I just like, with all my mind, I'm pulling back on my horse with my left hand. And then I grab my 7200 and I'm just like spraying and praying, trying, trying to get this shot. And uh, while I'm doing this, the horse starts bucking. He's spinning circles. Like he just does not want to, like he wants to be up next to his friend. So I think I took 30 or 40 images in this whole sequence. And fortunately, this one came out and everything's tack sharp. Um, a lot of people call Photoshop on this one. They're like, oh, the moose is floating. He's, he's not floating. He just happens to be on a little bit of a hill between the, the, the hunter or the, the guide in the, in the front and then the hunter in the back. Yeah. How far is the moose then approximately to the white horse up front? The guy in the front on the horse, he might have been 200 yards out. He was a ways. The moose was 200 yards out? Sorry, the, the, the guide in the, in, um, this guy here in the front was probably 200 yards out. From you? From me. And then, yeah, the moose maybe was 100 yards and then this guy was maybe 30 or 40 yards. So. But one cool thing with especially the 7200 is you do get some kind of crazy lens compression. So it allows you to get shots like that to where, you know, if you're just to glance at that, it looks kind of like they're all just like right there next to each other. But the point of all these stories is that, you know, hunting takes us to some pretty wild places and allows us to ex you know, experience some pretty insane things. I'm sure many of us in this room can relate to, you know, some aspect of this story. Hopefully not a horse dying. But like, you know, calling in elk, having really cool close encounters with elk, you know, living in Montana, that's a pretty huge thing. And for me, like, that's what photography is. That, that's why I love hunting photography so much is to be able to capture like these types of moments, uh, especially these moments where you're interacting with animals. So that's, that's what I'm always going for. Um, that said, you know, I obviously I do shoot a lot for various different hunting brands, Sika included. And you know, the way to think about that is like, well, you know, take, take these crazy moments and all you're doing is just like applying, like putting a brand into it. So let's use the example of uh, my first day ever out, out elk hunting and my dad um, having that bull at like two yards sitting there staring at him. So he's using a hoochie mama. So, so imagine if, if I had my camera and I took a photo of my dad standing there or, or sitting there at the base of the tree and he was like looking like this, looking up with his bowl and he's got the hoochie mama in his hand, like Primos would have loved that image. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's like a once in a lifetime shot. But also imagine if, if my dad was in full Sika, this was I think pre Sika days. Um, but it's just like, that's, a, that's an all time image right there. So, so thinking about like implementing, you know, brands into your photos, it's like, Basically, the way I think about it is just like, go do a really epic trip, try to capture some really cool moments, and just like naturally and authentically just implement products into whatever you're doing. So, um, 
That said, and so I use a, uh, I guess we can stay on here a sec. I think we, we all probably experience some sort of like creator's block. So, so imagine like you get this really brilliant idea and you're like, ooh, I need to write it down. Whether it's pen on paper or whether it's like typing it out on a computer. You're like, as soon as you go to the computer, all good. So I have the same ringtone. I was like, who's calling me? <laughs> um, as soon as you put pen on paper, you just like, you, you blank. You're like, ah, I don't know where to start. Same thing happens in photography. Same thing happens to me. Um, it'll happen when, say, you go out and something really amazing or epic happens or terrible happens. I think if I had another experience where Cookie died or a horse died, I probably wouldn't know what to do. But, well, I, I might now because I've had this learning lesson of like, shoot that, that's cool. Um, so anyway, so I use some tools. I, I call them um, shot themes. And they're not shot lists. You know, like a, a shot list would be something incredibly specific. You'd be like, all right, we need a picture of, say, a woman with <laughs> brunette hair walking up a ridge. And like, we want her kind of coming to us. We want a vertical. And like her reaching into her chest pocket, pulling out, say, an elk call out of this very specific jacket. Like, like that would be a shot list. I rarely go off that. Occasionally, a brand will send me something like that, and they want me to shoot that. But I, I rarely go off shot lists. What I do instead is use shot themes. And shot themes are just kind of these, these bigger kind of overarching um, yeah, like subject or like a, just like an idea that, that uh, works really well in, in photos. And so, so again, the whole purpose of these shot themes is to just kind of help you get past that creator's block. And um, so yeah, let's dive into, um, I'm going to share seven photo themes that I use all the time and we'll, uh, we'll dive into those. All right, so the first photo theme is small subject, huge landscape. Hunting takes us to some pretty massive places and just like the, the grandeur and um, like the scale of some of these places is, is absolutely insane. And so that, that's one element I always want to capture. And so let's just use this photo, for example. Um, if you know, we've got the hunter down here in the bottom corner, say, say he wasn't there. Like, it's a cool landscape shot, but you don't really get any perspective or scale on how big that country is. But as soon as you add a photo subject in there, um, typically, like, it's really small. You just get this like, sense of scale. Uh, brands also love these types of images. Um, imagine this shot, uh, vertical. Um, Sika, for example, might use this image and, and, and love to use this image in like a print ad because there's lots of like really nice, call it white space. If it was a darker photo, maybe black space um, up above, and there's just good good placement for text. So if, if so, if you are shooting for brands, like thinking about um, just nice clean images with lots of space um, is huge. Here's another example, uh, kind of same deal. Like if that plane was not in the photo. It would just be a, a, a meh photo. There's nothing super crazy about that. But as soon as you add the flow plane, um, it just adds a, a sense of scale here. And then this shot, this is my, my friend Dustin Rowe. We were in Azerbaijan in the Caucasus Mountains. We were, it's like right up against the Russian border. We were, I think we were at 14,000 feet. And uh, he, he's boot skiing down a slope in this shot. So um, one kind of cool element in this one. And I, I can't say that I actually went for this. It was just kind of what happened because I was just running behind him trying not to trip. Um, is that you can't see the top of the mountains. And the cool aspect of that is like you don't really know where the mountains end. And so it kind of creates this kind of mysterious vibe and feel to it. And the next photo theme is weather. So what typically happens when the weather starts getting bad, say it starts dumping rain or dumping snow, like most photographers, if you have a camera, like that's when their camera goes into their backpack. And in my opinion, like the exact opposite needs to happen. Actually, you should have your camera out at all times, but you should never put your camera away when the weather starts to turn bad. Um, weather just adds this really unique, fun element to images. So again, imagine this shot of going back on a boat to, to our, our main boat, this was on a um, Alaska bear hunt. Like, it would have been a cool photo if, there, if it wasn't raining, but like you had the, the, the rain factor, you had the weather factor, like the guy's got his hood up, it's just everything looks gnarly about it. Um, it just, it's a really a way to elevate um, your photos. So these cameras, they're not waterproof, they're very water resistant, they will survive getting rained on a little bit, but like multiple days on that, you're gonna have some problems. So 
One super easy hack is, <laughs> sorry, I call this a glorified garbage bag. Uh, these are called Rugard rain covers. You can get them on Amazon for like five bucks. Basically, it's a rain jacket for your camera. Just slip it on like that. It's got a draw cord on this end. And now you've basically got a rain jacket for your camera. You can shoot in bad weather when it starts dumping. Like, you don't have to be afraid that you're going to ruin your, ruin your electronics. So Rugard rain covers, um, there's a few different brands out there, but again, basically a glorified garbage bag. You could literally use a garbage bag and it would do the same thing. But very, very beneficial tool. I, I love shooting in bad weather. Again, another shot, gnarly weather. Um, so for this one specifically, you know, this is obviously a, a horizontal or landscape shot. This, this was like such a cool moment. I was just like, oh my gosh, I need to shoot wide, medium, tight, both horizontal and vertical of this exact scene. So I, I shot probably like 30 images, just, just framed in all different ways, basically of this exact scene. And, you know, a number of these photos have been used by, by brands all over. But, but again, thinking from, the, from a weather perspective, if it was nice, if there wasn't, if it wasn't snowing, you know, also, if, if there wasn't any snow, you wouldn't see those, those hunters silhouetted. And so it might have still been a cool photo, but you had the, you had the element of, of gnarly weather to it and it just like really makes it. So this one kind of builds on the previous photo theme as well of small subject, huge landscape, like, you know, small hunters in the corner, lots of space for text, and you also just get a bit of scale there. I shot this photo soon after that, that previous one. Uh, this is my friend, and he's the hunter, Kiviak. He comes up to the camera and the wind was blowing so bad it was making his eyes water. But then um, the water droplets on the end of his eyes were actually freezing. I was like, dude, like stop, just stand there for a sec and look at me. So I just took a, a photo of the, the freezing water droplet on his eyelash. Cameras are tools. It's, it's easy to say when you are paid to be a photographer. Um, but, you know, again, I suppose part of my thing with photography is going to wild, crazy places in crazy, gnarly weather. And, like, I, I love shooting photos in that. And, like, yeah, your cameras do get put through heck. And I wouldn't advise purchasing a camera, a used camera from me because it's probably survived many nights like that. But uh, this one, I, I actually I shot a time lapse overnight. We were on a winter goat hunt up in B.C., and like in February, and I didn't put anything over the camera, and then it, you know, at night it frosted really hard, obviously, and probably got down to zero. And this, this was the, I, I just took this shot with with my phone of my camera the next morning, and uh, yeah, completely just covered in frost, and yeah, still functions fine to this day. This is a, a Sony A7 uh, R3. It's not my primary camera, and still, but uh, it still still functions, still works great. So the next photo theme, third photo theme, is emotion. So the photo before this one was these four people, and they're, they're looking away. And we're in a cool spot. We're in New Zealand, um, up in the top left corner. That's actually Mount Cook, so like New Zealand's highest point. And like, you know, the, the, the feel of the photo when you looked at it, it was, it was cool. It's like you just couldn't really like, like, are the people stoked to be there? Are they like looking in awe, like what's happening? I just couldn't really get a vibe. And then my friend Jesse on the left there, like I didn't tell her to do anything. She literally just turns to the camera and she has a big grin on her face and she, she gives me the shaka. She's just like this and I think she's like, this is sick. <laughs> and like to me that just like made this photo, you know, cause, cause now I, I look at it and I can just like, I just feel like this level of like stoke happening. Next time you're like flipping through a magazine or you're on Instagram or whatever, just like think to yourself, like as you're, as you're scrolling, it's like what, what image is, am I actually connecting with right now? Is it, is it a photo of someone's face or is it a photo of like, or video or someone's going away? Um, it, it's kind of an interesting study and I, for most people it's like, oh yeah, like if I can see someone's face, like I'm gonna connect with that a lot better. Shooting people's faces is huge. Say, say your buddy shoots an animal or, or you do and you're like, okay, I wanna take like a shot of, of me with, with this cool elk I just, just killed. 
often what happens, I'm sure we can all relate to this, as soon as you pull the camera out, people get camera shy. They start to like act weird, they start to turn away. You ask them to, like, it's like, dude, be stoked right now. Like, like be as stoked as you just were five seconds ago before I pulled out this camera. I experience that all the time. The best facial expression is when someone is giving an authentic smile. How do we get an authentic smile? I think, like, I think the only answer is we gotta make people laugh. And so I've got a few jokes that I hold in my back pocket when I'm out with someone that's, that I haven't told my jokes to before, and I try to get them to laugh. And as soon as they laugh, like that's an authentic, that's a real smile, and that's when I will shoot photos. If they've heard all my jokes, my wife, for example, has heard all my jokes, she still somehow thinks I'm funny. What I'll do is I'll, I'll literally just ask her to laugh. I'll be like, Karen, can you just laugh right now? And she'll go, ha, 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 which is like obviously a super corny, cheesy laugh. But as soon as she's done laughing, she then, she then laughs at herself. So she does the real laugh after her fake laugh. And as soon as that, like, I'm like, okay, well, here we go. She gives her fake laugh, and then she starts laughing at herself, and that's when I shoot photos. So I use that one a lot. People think I'm crazy. But then after I shoot photos with them a few times, they just they kind of know the gig. So this was a shot of my buddy Isaac. Uh, again, sh shot a great, great elk. And the other thing about this, and I'll touch on this a little bit. So he's not looking at the camera. He's, he's looking at, like, looking at the antlers. He's just like ad admiring the antlers. And that, that's actually a, another photo theme we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit later. This one is of my wife and you can, you know, just see the side of her face. But again, it's a super emotional moment. She had, uh, this was actually last fall, um, killed her first elk with a bow. She shot it at 20 yards. The thing ran 30 yards and tipped over and died. And like, she just was flooded with emotion. She was relieved. She was sad. She was excited, just like every emotion you can think of was running through her in this moment. So I think we can all relate to walking up on an animal or a shed that you found. Like there's just like this crazy emotion that hits you. And you know, when you are shooting photos, really trying to capture that is huge. And in big game hunting, like it's pretty rare. It doesn't happen very often. So you wanna, you wanna be ready for it. The next photo theme is to get in front. One thing about when you are in front of the people, you can see their face. So back to faces and emotion. Um, also a small subject, big landscape, like there's just like kind of combining all of these elements into your images. Most hunting photos you see are going to be from behind. You know, most of the time you as a photographer, like you're not going to walk ahead of the hunter because you don't want to like mess something up, which is totally fine. That's, that's how I am. That's how most people are. So to get in front, it really boils down to communication. You know, you need to talk to your photo subject. Um, and just be like, hey, like, do you mind if I run ahead on this ridge right now and shoot some photos of you coming at me? Most time they're like, yeah, totally cool. And then like, if you're a hunter, you're gonna know kind of when it's a good time to do this is and when, when it's not. Like obviously if the elk are bugling, it's like, yeah, dude, like you don't wanna run ahead right now. Like this is stupid. There, there's a value of having some, some hunting background is kind of knowing when and um, when you can't do things. For this shot, uh, this was in the Missouri breaks on a bighorn sheep hunt. And so we were, we were hunting the the side of the river that the sun is on. You know, there was like three of us in this little raft. I just asked him, I was like, hey, like, do you guys mind if we just pull over really quick? I'll just like, I'm just gonna run down to this, uh, this shade line and shoot a photo of you floating down the river. And they're like, yeah, no problem. Like, we're not even hunting on that side. So it's like, no problem. Like, if you wanna get out as much as you can, like, that's fine. And so that's how I got this. As far as settings go, you know, to get this sun flare, I think I set my camera at like, the, like the aperture at, probably like F11 or F9 or something, just to get that really good sun flare. And if you, if you put the sun right on the edge of like a horizon, and if you do like F, F11, you'll, you'll get some pretty sick sun flares. So this was in British Columbia on a February mountain goat hunt. Same deal, got ahead of, ahead of the crew. And the thing about this shot is we had already, we had already killed a goat and we were actually going to retrieve it. And it was this pretty crazy retrieve to go get it. But at this point, like I wasn't worried about spooking anything, we had already We'd already killed the goat. We already did the thing. So it's like at that point, like if you're on a pack out, especially like, like use those moments to be like, oh sweet, I'm gonna run ahead. I'm gonna get all these crazy different angles. So I don't know about you guys in this room, but hunting for me is like, I don't know, probably 90% of the time, like just joking or joking around, goofing off, hanging out with your buddies, and then like the rest, you know, maybe that that 5% of the time is like you're actually serious. You're actually hunting. And so much of hunting photography these days is, and, and content in general, is like really serious. It's just like, you guys, like, I, like I wanna show the lighter side of hunting. And brand, brands love that too. Um, th this photo of, this is Dustin Rowe up in uh, Alberta on a sheep hunt. He's doing a karate kid on a rock. And comic relief is uh, something I'm always going for. This is my buddy Josh on a, on a bear hunt last year. 
you know, middle of the day, he just like randomly goes over to this, this log and starts riding it like a bull. And just, just ridiculous, you know? It's like, we all do this stuff. We all just act like goofballs when we're out there. So I think showing that lighter side of hunting is uh, pretty important. Good old group photo. So at the end of every trip, whether we're successful or not, um, I always put the camera on a tripod and I do a group shot. And for this one, well, all these group shots, I don't do the timer. I don't do the self timer. The problem with the self timer is you only get like one, maybe three photos. It'll just go click, 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 and then you gotta do it again. Um, what I'll do instead is I'll set my camera to interval shooting mode. And basically what I do is I have it take up one photo every second for like a minute. So I'm just like, I'm just gonna get like, cause like memory cards are crazy. Like, like in this camera, I've got two one terabyte memory cards in here, which is insane. Like I can shoot 50,000 photos of that. So like shooting 60 photos on a timer is like not a big deal. So what I'll do is, you know, we'll, we'll go out and we'll just do our classic group photo. All right, everybody smile. And then after a few seconds of people smiling and make sure, sure nobody is blinking, I'll be like, all right guys, now everybody make a funny face. You know, you'll, <laughs> fortunately everyone made a funny face in this one. Sometimes you'll get someone that doesn't make a funny face and that's what's really funny about the photo. Years later, after one of these hunting trips, I'll get a text from somebody on, on, that was on that trip and they'll send me this group shot, this funny face group shot. And they'll be like, man, that was an epic trip. Like so much fun. Like can't wait to do it again type of thing. They never send me like the crazy, you know, iconic like moose photo or anything. It's always these just like ridiculous group shots because at the end of the day, it's the experiences we have and it's experiences we have with friends, and uh, that's ultimately what it all boils down to. Admiration can mean a lot of things, but in this specific context, it's like, I wanna shoot photos showing, like, showing off how cool and amazing these critters are that we, for many of us, spend our lives hunting and pursuing. Like, this isn't about me, this is about like how just badass these animals are. So one shot is like kind of that first look when you first walk up to it. Um, whether you're close to it or whether you're 100 yards away, just kind of that first look that you see when you first see that animal is a fun one. Then this one, you know, there, there obviously is the hunter in the, in the image, and it's, just, it's more of like a reflecting image. One thing that I hear a lot from both hunters and both people that um, don't hunt, maybe, maybe not, not anti-hunters, you're never gonna convince an anti-hunter to hunt, but like people that maybe they're on the fence about hunting or maybe they've never hunted, they don't necessarily have anything against it. But what, so what hunters often say is when you only post a trophy photo, like a picture of you with your animal, they're like, man, I want to see the rest of it. Like, I know there was so much that went into like that whole hunt. Like, I want to, I want to hear about it. I want to see it. And then the non-hunters, I've, I've heard this many times, they will say, like, it's kind of weird. Like that guy, he's just smiling at the death of that animal. Like they just, they have no understanding of all the effort and time and effort that went into getting to this point of being there with, with that animal. So I think it's important to show respect. In 2011, I drew a cool elk tag in Montana and I hunted 45 days until I finally killed an elk. And so the, the kill was literally 1 45th of the entire experience of the hunt. And so if you only show the photos of the kill, or the end result, you're just like, man, like what else? Like tell, like I wanna hear all the other crazy cool things that happened out there. Cause like, you know, like there was some wild moments where all, probably all hunters in this room and we've all had some crazy experiences. So. To me, like, that's always my goal is to capture everything else. It's icing on the cake if you actually get an animal. Capturing the wild places the hunting takes you, the emotion, these crazy encounters you have with animals, like that's what it's all about for me. And the last photo theme, this is the holy grail of hunting photography. It's to get both an animal and the hunter in the same frame. Talking from a business perspective, like this shot has been licensed so many, so many times. I've made more money off of this photo than probably any of other any other photo in my million photo collection. I'm always like these are rare. If I can get one of these shots a year, I'm feeling pretty pretty good about myself and I spend probably 200 days a year out in the field like photographing stuff. The way to get these shots, you got to have 7200 in my opinion. So, you got to have a zoom lens and archery hunts obviously are great for this cuz with archery you got to get close. You have to get close. With a rifle, you might be 300 yards away or or further and it's just like, well, you're not going to get that. So archery hunts, 70 to 200, and as we're stalking in on an animal, like when we, start and get, when we start to get into that kind of red zone, I'll start hanging back a little bit. I'll try to keep an eye on that animal, and it's like, I do not want to mess this up. And oftentimes, like, like in this instance, um, this is my friend Connor here, I don't even think he could see the ram at this point. So I'm just standing there, and I'm just like slowly like moving my way across like this to like line up and get this shot. 70 to 200 and archery, and when you start to get close, just like back up a little bit and just have a little bit of flexibility to move her a little. 
and you know you might be able to get a shot like this you know another shot we, we covered this one already but uh what was this moose photo so ra raise the hands like how many people in the room you know have a an interchangeable lens or a mirrorless camera like this nice quite a few of you how many of you in here have one of these <laughs> everybody okay so we're, we're all photographers technically one one huge value of photography or not value but like one one problem i see happening a lot is people will be like okay, I need to buy this like $5,000 camera set up to like get into hunting photography or photography in general. And they do it, they, they think they just need to spend the money. And what happens is like, they go out and, I mean, this thing's heavy. It's, it's literally a pain in your shoulder to carry it and it's, it's a lot. You know, they go out first day, they'll have it on their shoulder, like, oh, I'm gonna get some sick shots. And then second day they go out and they're like, oh, this is like a pain and they, they put it in their backpack. Then maybe they spend the whole season and that camera lives in their backpack and it never comes out. You've got to keep your camera out if you want to do this. And that's really where the value of a phone comes into play here. We pretty much, we all have one, obviously. Most of us have one for like navigating with OnX, communication, obviously. Mine lives in my vinyl harness. So I just literally can just grab it and like press record or take pictures. I personally don't think the photo quality is that great on phones, but the video quality is pretty stunning. And uh, Actually today, a lot of my photo assignments now are basically just to create phone content, phone videos, cool moments that you capture with your phone. A couple years ago, I was out elk hunting by myself and I was just running light. I didn't have a camera on me. I, I had my phone on me, I had this camera. I ended up whistle bugling a bull in. I never tried it. I was like, I'm just gonna like whistle and make a bugle and see if I can call this bull in. Sure enough, call him in. In the moment, I'm sitting there with my bow and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what this bull looks like. I wanna like look at him first before I just start filming. He comes in, he was a younger bull. I was like, I didn't, didn't wanna shoot him. And so I just pressed record and again, captured on my phone, so. And it'll be up on this screen, you guys. So that bull, he came in, he was at 20 yards right there. He did a complete 360 around me. He winded me and I cow called a few times and he just got interested again. He just like kept walking around. And eventually I started throwing rocks at him. I was like, some, we, I need to educate you or something. <laughs> it was just like this crazy, crazy moment, you know? And we all have the capacity to capture stuff like that. We really do. And you know, with the way social media is right now and Instagram and everything, I mean, you can share that the same day. You don't have to like, import it and do a bunch of post-processing and editing. Like we all have the power to capture that type of stuff. So yeah, kind of my, my final point here is a lot of people say the best camera is the one that you know how to use. And although that is true, I, I would argue that the best camera is the one that's like the most easily accessible. And for a lot of us, that's gonna be our cell phone. That said, if you do not want to use your cell phone or you wanna get a, a bigger camera like this, I'll show you how I typically carry my cameras. So I don't use a neck strap. I, I have a neck strap on here, but it's, my camera usually doesn't live around my neck. This guy right here is called a cotton carrier. Uh, Peak Designs also makes something similar. There's a base plate on the bottom here, and this camera will literally just slide into this base plate. And now it's one-handed operation to pull it out. I just literally twist and bring up, and I can shoot. So typically when I'm on photo assignments, I will have um, this set up right here. I, also, I will also have a chest rig. Um, so I can swap, you know, locations from camera from, from here to here and just like one handed easy operation. Uh, again, Peak Designs makes one that's basically the same. My only beef on the Peak Design one is that it does take two hands to operate and it makes an audible click. So if you're in like tight, if you're into bow hunting or whatever, like if your camera's going click, like you don't want to screw the, screw the hunt up. So having a, having one that's totally quiet, um, to me is, is pretty valuable. So. Cotton carrier, it is a little bit bigger. It is a little bit more clunky and chunky. Um, Peak Design is gonna be like the most streamlined thing you can imagine. So that's kind of the, the difference between the two. That said, um, that's a wrap. I hope you guys learned something, took away something from this. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's open it up to 